Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vanessa Little. I'm the director of NFV Ecosystem Architecture over at VMware. Uh, I'm going to be speaking to you today about open source orchestrators, uh, what's out there, what are they doing, uh, a little bit of compare and contrast. I'm not going to touch on all of the open source orchestrators because there are quite a few, especially in the research community, but I am going to focus more on uh, the big four, as I call them. And, um, and then I'm going to leave a little time at the end for some question and discussions. So the first question of the day is, why even bother with orchestration for NFV? Um, and the problem statement, as I've defined it here, is the virtualized network services are becoming more and more complex. These, these service infrastructures are getting larger and more difficult to manage with more and more moving parts. Um, and as we virtualize the entire stack, it becomes more difficult to deploy these services uh, and maintain the life cycle of these services. And so a certain level of automation is required. Um, and that's why, that's why the whole Mano movement sort of rose up, because it becomes untenable to manage all of these workloads manually the way it used to be managed when they were all physical appliances. And so as the complexity increases, the time to deployment now also decreases. And so in order to stay competitive, Orchestration becomes a key component in, in NFE deployments, um, mostly because it's not possible to take six months to deploy a new service anymore. Previously, service providers could take that time to do that kind of burn-in, rack and stack that equipment, test everything, work with their vendors to make sure everything was properly integrated, and then finally bring a service to market. And now that six months is being shrunk to six weeks and getting even closer to six days. And so, with, unless you could throw an army of people at building out these services to, to accelerate that, um, orchestration becomes an absolute necessity. And so when you look at the open source orchestrators versus the commercial solutions, there's pros and cons on both sides. Uh, for open source, the pros are <clears throat> all the requirements are community driven. And so all of the participants get to actually say which features are going to appear in this orchestrator and have those features appear in a relatively quick manner, at least within around six months. Um, the ability to stay vendor agnostic and integrate what's needed when it's needed. And so by being able to pick and choose those components that you need, because you're the one contributing the code, you have all the control. Um, that's, that's one of the great things about open source communities, and that's one of the reasons why conferences like this even exist, because those communities are very effective in doing that. Some of the cons are community development can be difficult to manage. If you have um, two very large contributors that have very opposing viewpoints about an architectural decision or uh, a feature set that they'd like to see integrated that really diverges the project, that can create some tension, some friction, and really stall the project. And, and generate some code that's perhaps not as effective for the whole community, but really only benefits the people that are contributing it. Um, we've seen this happen into some, uh, some other open source communities where they really reach an impasse and they're forced to fork the code and go two different directions. Uh, but eventually it, it seems to work out. Um, the biggest con about open source development and, and, and open source MANO solutions is the lack of commercial support. And so when you look at the NFE landscape, the biggest consumer of this are service providers, telcos. These are companies that, have, that are bound to SLAs on their services. And so they look to um, commercial support models to be able to, to provide those SLAs to their customers. They need someone that they can get on the phone that's going to help them fix their problem when something goes sideways. When you're using open source software, this is not, this is not viable. And so that type of support needs to be brought in-house. And so instead of having that, that one throat to choke or that 1-800 number to call, you now have to have these resources brought into your, your own company to be able to do this, this kind of commercial level support and achieve those level of SLAs that you've been providing to your customers so far. Then on the commercial side, the pros are that you end up with a fully supported solution it's been pre-tested and pre-integrated, and a lot of people have spent a lot of time and effort into making sure that this solution works right out of the box before you install it at your premises. The cons are um, 
commercial vendors are going to build things that benefit their solution. And so a lot of the orchestrators that, are, um, that work with, with commercial solutions are more tightly integrated with the VNFs that those companies also provide. So if you look at the, the network equipment providers like Nokia and Ericsson, they have great orchestration solutions that work really well with their own VNFs. When you try to integrate other VNFs, it's really hit or miss. Um, there's, there's a significant amount of development work that has to happen or professional services that, that needs to happen to, to integrate other VNFs and keep that vendor agnostic landscape. Uh, it ends up being quite expensive to do so, which speaks to the point of uh, changes require costly professional services. And so in a commercial solution, if you wanted to bolt on new capabilities, add new features that are specific to your company's needs, it's going to cost a lot of money to be able to do that with that commercial vendor. Some vendors don't even have the capability to add those, those features on, and so you're really locked into what their roadmap is able to provide. And, and if that doesn't necessarily suit your business needs, you're kind of, you're kind of out of luck. Um, and then finally, the VIM and the VNF and the infrastructure options are limited because these companies can only test with so many different combinations of VIM, VNF, and, and hardware providers. And so um, you either run the risk of running an un untested solution or you're locked into a certain, a certain vendor paradigm or a certain group of vendors because that, that is the only configuration that can be supported by that commercial vendor. And then there's the data model war that's still, still very alive and well in the open source orchestration community, Tosca versus Yang. And it does at, at times feel like a real battle of the rock'em sock'em robots. When you look at Tosca and Yang, and I'm not going to go too deep into this because we could spend uh, hours just talking about the differences and the, the pros and cons of Tosca and Yang. Um, one of them comes from cloud orchestration and focuses on things like um, application orchestration and management. And uh, it's designed for modeling enterprise cloud workloads and describes the workloads as a topology template. And then on the other side, you have Yang, which has roots in network design and network architecture. Um, and it was really focused on network deployment and configuration and, the model, and models the network services and the configuration state data. So when you're looking at NFV, your requirements for orchestration are really kind of a Venn diagram of the intersection of the two. Um, Tosca doesn't do everything that you need, and neither does Yang, but there are workarounds to make each of them work for your needs. Um, there are a lot of NFV purists that would argue that the best solution is both Tosca and Yang integrated together. Um, unfortunately, the orchestration community doesn't really implement them that way. They really do one or the other. Um, there are methodologies to be able to do Tosca embedded in Yang or Yang embedded in Tosca or shell scripts embedded in either, uh, but then that really becomes more of a custom one-off solution and not a repeatable model. And so um, when we look at the open source orchestrators, we really see uh, two factions, those that have, have aligned with Tosca and those have, that have aligned with Yang. and. Um, we're starting to see a bit of a convergence where people are getting a little more open-minded. Uh, and when I get into the feature sets later on, you'll see that there are some orchestrators that are willing to accept both Tosca and Yang, but they prefer one of the, uh, over the other. Um, a lot of orchestrators have extended those data models away from the industry standards to be able to achieve some things that aren't accounted for in the standards just yet. And so, even though there are standards for Tosca and Yang, you end up with proprietary solutions, even in the open source orchestration community, that align with both Tosca and Yang. And so the four that I'm gonna, I'm gonna discuss today are the big four, as I like to call them, in open source orchestration, and that's ONAP, OSM, Cloudify, and Rift. Uh, there are obviously other other orchestrators, open source orchestrators, a lot of them are led by research projects or university projects. Um, and a lot of those, those orchestrators are exactly that. They're, they're research projects. And that's why I didn't really, I'm not going to go too deep into those today. Um, 
because in my opinion, they need a lot of work before they could really be a production grade solution. And right now, they're really very useful for things like research projects and university projects. So let's dig a little deeper into each of these. So ONAP uh, is a Linux Foundation project and is now part of the Linux Foundation Networking Fund uh, as of January 2018 when they did their reshuffle and their consolidation of the networking projects. Uh, and it was founded in mid-2017 when we saw a convergence of OpenO and um, the Open Ecomp projects from AT&T. So the first release was as recently as November of 2017. That was the Amsterdam release. And they're now on Casablanca, which is the third release. Um, I think that comes out next week or later this week. It comes out mid-November. Um, the key players in this project are AT&T and China Mobile, China Telecom, China Unicom, and Amdocs. There are a number, number of other large contributors, VMware being one of them. Um, but a, the, the key, key players that are really driving this project, driving the main requirements, and, uh, and driving the direction are those that I've listed here. Um, the core focus of ONAP is sort of this all-encompassing master orchestrator to be able to integrate with OSS and BSS on the north end and be able to integrate with multiple different types of VIMS and SDN solutions on the south end to be able to build a fabric, an orchestration fabric, that can, that can more or less do everything. Um, pros about this solution is that it's very feature rich. Cons about this solution is that it's really big and a bit of a challenge to install. Um, those people that just want to just want to take a swing at it and, and play with it a little bit, you need a significant amount of infrastructure. This is not something that you can, just, you can deploy in a home lab. Um, this is something that you need to be really serious about testing and be able to put the resources and the time behind actually building it. That said, ONAP is really built to be modular. And the idea is that not everyone is going to deploy the entire solution. You're going to pick and choose those components that make sense for your infrastructure and build and deploy those ones. And we've already seen some success with companies like Bell Canada being able to pick and choose a few of those components and, uh, and start to productionalize them. Um, the next is Open Source Mano, or OSM. Uh, this is an Etsy project. And so there's a lot of um, unfounded press uh, around the friction between the two projects, uh, Open Source Mano and, and, and ONAP. There's this perception that they need to somehow be enemies because one's an Etsy project, one's a Linux Foundation project, where in reality there are topologies that are actively being worked on that include them both. Um, because OSM's core focus is more on the VIM and SDN layers down and being able to do really good um, service orchestration and modeling and day two life cycle operations, there are topologies that make sense where you could have uh, ONAP as the master global orchestrator and OSM relegated to more of a regional orchestrator and have them working together. Um, because of OSM's um, Etsy Sol 5 standardized northbound API, these types of topologies are actually really simple and, and elegant to throw together. Uh, and so um, I may be a little bit biased in saying this because I happen to be the technical steering chair for OSM, but I just want to dispel any rumors. There is no animosity between OSM and ONAP. If anything, uh, we're actively collaborating and, and looking at ways that we can work together to achieve integrated topologies because the two orchestrators really address different needs. And so OSM founded in April 2016. The first release was in May 2016, uh, which we called Release Zero because it wasn't really a formal release. It was more of a demo and a proof of concept. Um, the current release is Release 5. It's coming out in early December. And the key players in, in that project, the key drivers, are really Telefonica, British Telecom, Telenor, and Sprint. Um, they're the ones who really set the roadmaps and, and push a lot of the, the higher level requirements. There's also a really significant academic presence in OSM. Because most of the participants are based out of Europe, there's a significant amount of funding in Europe for research projects in this space. And so there are a lot of academic communities that participate and contribute a significant amount of code to OSM. And so in that respect, the innovation is, is 
really happening at a breakneck speed in OSM because it's, it's coming from the academic community instead of just being driven by vendor or, or CSP requirements. Um, originally, this project was really thought to be the realization of those Etsy standards and sort of a proving ground to take, those, take the standards that are being divided, be, are being designed by Etsy and apply them. That was really the initial idea behind OSM. But in practice, what we're seeing happening is those standards are being sort of cherry picked. And there's, there's this really beautiful feedback loop that happened as a result of this project spinning up where OSM will look at those Etsy standards, consume as many as possible, and then feedback the, the reasons why they couldn't consume the whole standard and add those features that they think are missing from the standards. And so there's this really nice loop that's happening between uh, the people at Etsy making the standards and the people working on OSM to really drive the rapid improvement of those standards instead of them just being this academic holy grail that's sort of pushed down to the community without anyone really weighing in on whether or not they work or they're valid. Um, up next, we have Cloudify. So this one is not a Linux foundation or an Etsy project. These guys are independent. Um, they were founded in 2012. They're based out of Israel. And their first release was in February of 2012. The current release is 4.4. Um, their key players are independent investors. So these guys are a little bit unique in that their core roadmap is driven internally by the Cloudify staff. Um, they, they take feedback from their partners and from their customers. But it's not uh, a community-driven open source project in the traditional sense of the word. Um, while they do contribute the code and have, it, have an Apache 2 license and have it available for other people to play with, they also offer a commercial version of the Cloudify orchestrator that has a few additional features. Um, Cloudify's core focus was originally nothing to do with NFE at all. Their core focus was orchestration of all cloud workloads, things like looking at um, dev stacks and web stacks and, and um, just being able to automate any kind of thing that you would need to virtualize. That was Cloudify's original core focus. And they came to the NFE party later than some of the other players. And they've done it very well. Um, so they approach the open source, they approach the orchestration paradigm more from the cloud end of the spectrum as opposed to the network end of the spectrum. And so they're more feature rich on the cloud side. Whereas someone like Rift approached it from the other angle. So Rift is also an independent company that their roadmap is driven entirely by independent development. Um, they're a privately held company, and so they have private investors. They come at the open source orchestration realm from the network end of the spectrum. And so things like doing complex layer three models and integration with physical network functions, um, these are things that, that Rift came at first and sort of looked at more of the cloud type orchestration um, and day two lifecycle operations as a secondary thing. And so it's, it's kind of interesting to see such, two such similar companies um, and two such similar open source orchestrators come at it from two completely different angles and sort of arrive around the same spot in the middle. Um, so Rift's first release was in May of 2016, and their current release is 5.3. Um, and they recently rebranded as Rift. They were formerly known as Rift.io, but the product itself is called Riftware. And similar to Cloudify, they have their open source Apache 2 version that you can download and play with as much as you like, and their commercial version that has a few extra features and extensions um, that you can buy a commercial support contract on. And as I mentioned, their, their core focus started from the network side of the house. Um, a lot of their employees initially were ex-Cisco and ex-Spiron employees, and so they, they had a lot of knowledge around um, being able to build complex networks and optical networking, um, and then translated that into the NFV space. And so here, this slide's a bit of an eye chart, and uh, I believe you'll be able to download my deck so you can go over it later on your own. But this is sort of a compare and contrast 
side-by-side -side feature comparison summary. Um, so the first thing I have listed on here is the Etsy standards adoption, and you'll notice here that not one of these orchestrators has complete Etsy standards adoption. I'm just going to pause there and let that sink in. Because Etsy is such a huge driving factor in all of these orchestration activities and all of the NFE activities and all of these open source projects that are popping up, yet no one project can say that they align with Etsy 100%. And there's two reasons for that. One, because those standards are a moving target and they're constantly being improved. And, and two, a lot of these orchestra well, all of these orchestrators have made some very tactical decisions to have something that's useful in market today without waiting for the standards to catch up. And so what we're seeing is more and more adoption of the Etsy standards as those Etsy standards are being ratified by the people trying to use them. So it's, it's the, sort of this, this cyclical behavior that, that's happening in the standards community, which is actually very beneficial. Uh, because what we're in, the end result is standards that are actually very useful by the community as opposed to standards that are very academic. Um, the data models between the, the different orchestrators, um, ONAP uses Tosca and Heat, OSM has Yang models, Cloudify is a Tosca-based orchestrator, Rift can accept Tosca but is mostly a Yang-based orchestrator. Um, they're all different. They're all doing something different, and none of the data models are portable, which is unfortunate for those of us that would like to be able to build a descriptor and then try it out with a different orchestrator. Unfortunately, building descriptors for each of these orchestrators is a unique exercise and a unique effort where you have to start from scratch, and pretty much none of the components are portable. Um, Vim support for OpenStack, everybody has it across the board. Vim support for AWS, everybody has that across the board. Vim support for vCloud Director, everybody but ONAP has that. Um, virtual Machine EPA support, um, where the Vim supports it, all of these orchestrators are able to, to model that and push that down to a Vim. Um, Kubernetes support, everybody but Rift currently boasts Kubernetes support, but um, just between us, they all have varying degrees of Kubernetes support and Kubernetes integration. Some of them are able to connect to the Kubernetes APIs and do everything you could ever want to do to a Kubernetes cluster. Some of them are able to build that Kubernetes cluster before you actually administrate it. Um, but, but for the most part, everyone but Rift boasts Kubernetes integration and being able to deploy Kubernetes-based workloads alongside VM-based workloads. Um, the community size and activity, ONAP, is huge. There are a ton of members, there are a ton of people contributing code. The code base is massive. Um, OSM is smaller than that, but still somewhat large with over 100 members um, is in a significant code base that's been ramping up over the last uh, two and a half years. Um, it's, a, it's a very active community. Um, Cloudify's community is very small because their community is Cloudify. There are some people that might do um, data models or descriptors and then contribute them back to the open source community, but everyone who contributes to the core code base of Cloudify is a Cloudify employee, and the same goes for Rift. And so in that, in that sense, those two communities are, are actually quite small. Um, physical device provisioning and PNF integration. Um, I've listed partial support for ONAP and OSM. They both have ODL connectors and the ability to manipulate open flow type devices. Um, but I wouldn't call that complete feature rich for physical device provisioning. There are physical devices that one might need to orchestrate that don't happen to speak open flow. They do exist. Um, and so I'm calling these as partial support. Cloudify and Rift haven't, haven't built that kind of integration, but you can achieve physical device orchestration with those two orchestrators by bolting on some scripts in your data models. So it's not entirely fair to say it's completely unsupported, but to get support for it, it's, it's a bit of a, a workaround. Um, Multi-site and multi-vim support, ONAP and OSM both boast that. Cloudify I've listed as partially supported um, just because of, of the way you need to deploy Cloudify and the number of instances you need to be able to have um, multi-vims connected to the same instance of Cloudify. It's, it's a little bit um, unusual, let's say, but it, but it does work. And then Rift is able to have as many vims as you'd like to connect to it. 
Um, policy management. So this is a broad term. Policy management can mean a lot of things. Um, for ONAP and OSM, policy management um, specifically speaks about the ability to set um, metrics and monitoring for all of the, the monitoring FCAPS integration. Um, Cloudify and Rift also have these capabilities, but they're implemented somewhat differently. Um, and monitoring and FCAPS integration, um, ONAP is, I've listed as partially supported, but I think we could safely say it's, it's properly supported. They have a great module that integrates with um, monitoring both the VIM layer and the VNF layer to be able to do closed and open loop um, service assurance. OSM, as of release four, boasts that capability as well. Cloudify also has great monitoring and FCAPS integration. Um, Rift, less so. They do have some very preliminary, rudimentary integrations, but I wouldn't call it as feature rich as, as any of the other guys. Um, and finally, the commercial support model. ONAP and OSM don't have it. They're, they're truly open source communities. And while there are companies that are sniffing around saying that they'd be willing to provide an open so, uh, um, a full commercial support model if a customer wanted to buy it, no one has formally announced one yet. No one's, no one's listed, no one has a price list that says this is how much it's gonna cost you to get support on these open source orchestrators. And so I've listed these both as a not supported. Um, but Cloudify and Rift, as I mentioned, have full commercial support models. You can buy a support contract for the orchestrator from them. You know exactly how much it's gonna cost and what you're gonna get uh, for what, you, what you've paid the for. So that said, where do we go from here? Um, are these orchestrators production ready? And if so, why isn't anybody running them in production yet? Um, Cloudify and Rift do have commercial deployments today, um, but we're not seeing huge deployments. We're not seeing those, those tier one massive NFE deployments that we all kind of envisioned. Uh, and the question is why? Is, is it because of the, the support model? Is it because these companies are small? Is it because there's, there's this view that open source is not really uh, production grade? The answer is all of the above. Um, if you ask any, any specific service provider why haven't you deployed an open source orchestration solution yet, they will all give you a different answer. One is we don't really need orchestration yet because we only have a few VNFs deployed and we can handle it manually. Uh, another answer is we don't want to spend the money on it yet until we've seen somebody else prove it out and we've seen somebody else you know, try and fail a few times with it and really refine it. Um, the list goes on and on. Um, I think it's really just a matter of time uh, before these open source orchestrators um, are really deployed. It's gonna take someone to take that big leap of faith. It's gonna take an AT&T or a Telefonica to really announce to the world, yes, we deployed it in production and nobody died. Um, and until that happens, I think we're gonna, we're gonna see some very hesitant adoption. We're seeing a lot of POCs, we're seeing a lot of demos, but so far no real large commercial deployments. So that said, uh, we have a few minutes left for questions or comments, yes. Why was open baton not mentioned? I, No, I'll, I can repeat the question. Um, so the question was, why was Open Baton not mentioned? And is it, was, is it because it's more intended for smaller scale deployments? Um, the answer is because it's more of an academic project. And the likelihood of that project of getting commercial support is a long way away. Um, I've really identified the, the linchpin for open source orchestrators turning into production grade orchestrators as that commercial grade support. That's, that's the key factor that needs to be addressed before these, these orchestrators can really become viable solutions. And so with Open Baton, it's, it is a cool orchestrator. It's, it's very effective, but it's an academic project. So the question was, how about Tacker? Is it because it only works with OpenStack as the Vim? 
Um, partially, yes. Um, and partially because Tacker doesn't account for a lot of the, the features and use cases required by NFV. And so Tacker, in its own right, is a great orchestrator for cloud workloads. But when you're looking at NFV workloads and being able to do complex modeling of layer three services, um, being able to define SDN overlay as well as uh, networking underlay, Tacker really falls down there because it doesn't have the features to do that. And that's why I didn't include this. I didn't include it in this presentation because it's not really ready for NFV. And given the, the lack of support for Tacker in, um, in, in development and how small that community is getting now, I don't have a lot of faith that it's going to get there. And that's just my personal opinion. And feel free to disagree with me. But um, we've seen a, a sharp decline in participation in the Tacker community in the last few years. And so I'm starting to lose faith that they're going to add the features that we'd really need for NFE. So I'm really curious. Uh, the use cases or the, the orientation you've cited so far is mostly telco based. Uh, what about big banks, say, that are running large data centers uh, themselves? Uh, are they interested in, in adopting any of these? Yes, uh, actually. Um, there's a major bank in, in Canada, I believe, yeah. that's using Cloudify yeah. as, as their production orchestrator. Um, so, so when we say NFE, yeah, I, I'm, I'm speaking almost specifically about telcos and service providers, but NFE for enterprise workloads is a viable use case. And, and yes, a lot of this applies to those use cases as well. Yeah, and that, that, that's really important to point out. So Cloudify is a really big participant and, and heavy contributor into ONAP, just as Rift is a big contributor into OSM. Um, and so you're seeing this intersection of open source orchestrators for, for different use cases, um, and it's making sense for this collaboration to happen. How would you compare the four you mentioned with the uh, HashiCorp Terraform? How would we compare the four that we've mentioned with Terraform? That's an, that's an excellent and interesting question. Um, and that brings me back to the network service orchestration. Um, Terraform has a lot of great features. And yes, you can achieve network service orchestration with Terraform, but it's done in a totally different way than people have been thinking about it when you look at how the Etsy standards are, are defined. And, you know, here's a little box that says Mano, and here's what Mano's supposed to do, and here's what that interface is supposed to look like. Terraform does something totally different. Um, not that that something totally different is ineffective. There's a lot of people having huge success with Terraform. I'm a, personally a big fan of it. Um, but when you look at the, the mentality behind Mano and the expectations of Mano and how that's been defined, particularly by the standards community, Terraform doesn't fit very well into that little box. That said, um, the features in Terraform are actually very comparable to the ones we've, we've discussed here today. Any other questions? Comments, high fives, hugs? <laughs> one more question, OK. Just one last one. Uh, I was, uh, it, it was interesting to mention, see that you mentioned monitoring as a row in your comparison chart. Um, can you speak a bit to that? Because I find it an essential thing if you want to have an orchestra to become successful. Uh, that's a very important consideration, how well you allow monitoring to happen after the service is deployed. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great, great comment. Um, so monitoring is an essential part of orchestration. Because when you think of orchestration, don't just assume that you're talking about that day zero, get that thing deployed. That's only part of the equation. Part of the responsibility of orchestration is not just get the thing deployed, but then what do I do with that thing afterwards? What do I do day two? And so having monitoring as a component of orchestration, being able to integrate with monitoring components, not necessarily become a monitor, but being able to integrate with those monitoring components and get at least a summary of that telemetry to be able to make intelligent decisions, you need that to be able to do closed loop and open loop service orchestration. And so think of, think of a scenario like this, where you have, you have a network service that has 15 different components. 
Uh, some of them are physical, some of them are virtual, some, are, some of them are containers, some of them are VMs, they're across different data centers. And you have a monitoring system that's monitoring the health of all these different things. That monitoring system needs to be able to tell the orchestrator, this service is unhealthy and I need, and I need it restarted. Or, or this service is under load and I need it scaled out. Or this service is not under load, I need it scaled back in to reserve some resources. That interaction between monitoring and orchestrator is essential. There's no way you could do that without that, that, that interface. And so that's why I listed monitoring integration as a key part of a, an orchestrator's capabilities. It's one that was traditionally kind of left behind as an afterthought, but I think people are finally realizing orchestrators really need to know what's happening to the infrastructure after the service gets deployed. All right, anyone else? All right, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of the, the conference. <laughs>